What happens to your body from a scientific point of view when you take ketamine? Welcome to a new episode of The Effects of Drugs, a series that analyzes drugs from a scientific point of view. Oh, and if you haven't watched all the previous episodes yet, definitely make sure you do because they're really cool. Ciao ragazzi, this video was written and filmed in Italian by our team of scientists, storytellers and video makers, manually translated into English, but, but, dubbed with artificial intelligence. Long live culture and let's go back to the video. The story of ketamine begins on March 26, 1956, when Harold Maddox, a research chemist at Park Davis, a big-name American pharmaceutical company that's now part of Pfizer, who we all know, synthesized a substance called fencyclidine. It was originally tested as an anesthetic, however, it quickly became evident that it caused patients to experience delirium and paranoia. So it was shelved for a few years until in 1962, another chemist from Park Davis, named Calvin Lee Stevens, resumed work on it. It was Stevens who, using fencyclidine as a starting point, successfully developed a new drug, ketamine. Right from the outset, ketamine was used as an anesthetic and sedative for both humans and, get this, for animals as well. You know how in movies they shoot those tranquilizer darts at animals to knock them out in just a few seconds? <coughs> well, those darts could very well contain ketamine. Yes, because ketamine taken like that, in a nice, hefty dose, really would have that effect. Ketamine is still used as a medicine in hospitals today. It's actually such an important medicine that it's been placed on the essential medicines list, a list drawn up by the World Health Organization containing all the medications it considers indispensable, ones which all hospitals should have on hand. If it's a medicine, then why is selling and using it outside a hospital setting illegal? And more importantly, what psychotropic effects does it have that make it so dangerous? Let's ask our chemist. To answer these questions, we first need to make a clear distinction between the medical use of ketamine, by which I mean what happens in hospitals where it's mainly used as an anesthetic and more recently as an antidepressant, and its illegal and recreational use, which takes place clandestinely. So basically, it's a substance that has two sides to it. On the one hand, it's a super important medicine, on the other, it's a dangerous drug. But what exactly is the difference down to? In the medical field, ketamine is administered in high doses and has a sedative and anesthetizing effect. And this is because of the way it binds to certain receptors in the brain, especially those for glutamate. Glutamate is a neurotransmitter, so it goes from one neuron to another to pass signals, and it's the principal excitatory neurotransmitter in the nervous system. Ketamine, though, effectively latches onto the glutamate receptors, which are called NMDA receptors, thereby making them unable to absorb the glutamate. So the signal is blocked, it no longer gets passed on. Basically, it's kind of like the glutamate tap has been turned off. And it's exactly this process that is behind its anesthetizing effect, useful, for example, for operations under anesthesia. Ketamine, in fact, induces what's called dissociative anesthesia, in which the patient is in a sort of half-sleep. They can even respond to commands but feel no pain. It's one of the few anesthetics you can take by mouth, and it suppresses breathing much less than most other anesthetics do. But because of its hallucinogenic effect, it's not used very often. When it's used for recreational purposes, the doses administered are considerably lower. And that's precisely why ketamine has a different impact. It's all down to the dosage. Even though the mechanism is not yet entirely clear, at low doses, ketamine boosts glutamate production by attaching itself to non-NMDA receptors, and it also encourages the formation of new synapses. Plus, get this, ketamine also binds to opioid receptors, the same ones that opiates like heroin latch onto, so it acts as a painkiller. But wait, there's more. Ketamine can also boost the levels of other neurotransmitters in the brain, like norepinephrine, dopamine, and serotonin. All these factors play a part in triggering the typical effects of the substance. And what are these effects? What happens when you get high on ketamine? Well, first of all, for it to have an effect, it's clear that the substance has to be taken in some way, and ketamine is usually either snorted, injected, or dissolved in water, depending on its form. In fact, it comes in different forms, as a liquid, a powder, or crystals. If snorted, ketamine begins to take effect within a few minutes, 
inducing a sense of euphoria and feelings of calmness and serenity. Plus, from a physical point of view, you'll experience a decline in motor function, have trouble talking, tachycardia, and high blood pressure, all followed by confusion and nausea. Basically, the user will soon find themselves in a state in which they are disassociated from reality, where their body fails to respond quickly to commands and visual auditory hallucinations can occur, which may be intense and often involve entering into a sort of inner reality. You might experience something called ego dissolution, a condition in which you feel like your own identity is actually disintegrating, like you're stepping out of your own body and blending into the world around you. This condition can be either a good or a bad thing, depending on the user's perceptions. If it's perceived in a positive light, the condition experienced is referred to as K-land in slang. On the other hand, if it's perceived in a negative way, this condition can lead to a state of immobilization and paranoid thinking, referred to as a K-hole, sort of like falling into a black hole. But what's really worrying are the long-term effects. Ketamine, in fact, can lead to a real addiction for the user, who, over time, will find themselves craving ever larger doses with some very serious consequences. One of the most devastating effects of the substance involves the bladder. Yes, it sounds crazy, but people who regularly use this stuff might even have to go through a particular kind of surgery. It's called a cystectomy, an operation to remove all or part of the bladder. Let's have a closer look at all this. Basically, our bladder is lined on the inside with a layer of epithelial cells whose job it is to contain the urine. Well, ketamine actually destroys the epithelial cells on the inner layer of the bladder so they can no longer perform their crucial function and thus allow urine to penetrate the surrounding tissue. So, urine exits the bladder, comes into contact with the tissue and damages it in turn, causing inflammation and sores that, over time, will limit the bladder's muscle capacity, making it harder and harder for it to expand. All of this inevitably causes the user to experience excruciating pain, blood in their urine and incontinence. And in extreme cases, it can even lead to death or, as mentioned before, to the removal of the whole organ. This happens also because it is often too late when people realize how serious the situation is, as the excruciating pain is dulled by the analgesic or pain-killing properties of the substance. It's bad for you and hurts you, but the stuff also takes away the pain, so it's a really messed up situation. Regularly using ketamine can also lead to serious memory issues, flashbacks, and, at high doses, even respiratory depression, which might degenerate into respiratory failure. This means your respiratory system can't get enough oxygen into your blood, so you'll be running dangerously low on oxygen. Getting back to the use of ketamine in the medical field, it's worth mentioning that besides being a very useful drug for its anesthetic properties, in 2019, the FDA, that's the US Food and Drug Administration, approved ketamine as a treatment for depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, and mood disorders. In fact, a derivative of it, called esketamine, has proved to be extremely effective as an antidepressant. Esketamine, unlike other antidepressants, has an exceptionally high success rate and starts to kick in remarkably quickly, offering rapid relief. It comes as a nasal spray and can only be prescribed to patients who haven't responded well to treatment with at least two traditional antidepressants. And it can only be given in outpatient settings with a professional present. So essentially, we're talking about assisted psychotherapy here. So no, you can't actually find or buy ketamine over the counter at your local pharmacy. So ketamine is a multifaceted substance that, as we saw with Dena, is also widely used in the medical field. Just because it's technically classified as a medication doesn't mean you should be fooled into thinking it's harmless. It's still a really dangerous substance that should only be used in very specific cases and should always be prescribed by medical professionals. And of course, a huge thanks to you all for staying with us until the end of the video. I hope you like this series on the effects of drugs, and I warmly invite you, if you haven't already done so, to catch up on all the previous episodes. I'll catch you for the next video right here on Geopop Everyday Science. Ciao!